There we go. And now we are live on this amazing author's show. And today I have somebody beautiful with me. And this lady, <laughs> she is so... <laughs> Lucy, she's laughing already because she's like so humble. And there's a reason why I love her so much. Laura Saren. She is not just a lady. She's a lady who changed so many lives, transformed them. And she's still so humble. And we are having today Laura with us with her amazing book, The Sexual Health of Man. Welcome, Laura, to our show. How are you today? I'm very well. And I can see, Olga, that we're both in the red today. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's power branding. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Not red for danger, but red for alertness. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I love that. But by the way, your book is also kind of has reddish colors, right? Yeah, yeah. It's here. It does. Reddish exactly. Red. There we it's go. Exactly. Like, it's as if it was planned. <laughs> yes. Let's not tell anybody we haven't planned this, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's not say that actually we have pre-planned that. But Laura, I'm so excited to have you back because we recently just have had another show with you and I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And I was just amazed by how much wisdom you have on mental health and always speaking about well-being of men. And it's quite remarkable. And I had quite a lot of responses from men as well. And they were saying actually how important this topic is. And I'm absolutely blown away that you also have an actual book on that. It's really amazing. Yeah. me. But do you mind to share the story of this book? Why did you decide to actually release this book? And, you know, what was the what was the aim of this book at the beginning of you writing that? OK, well, actually, the book is um, quite old, really, now. I mean, it um, it was it was published originally in 2008. And um, the book came out of um, research and work that I'd been doing around with men, particularly around men and health and sexual health. Um, as you, you may know already, I am a qualified nurse yeah. and I'm a specialist in sexual and reproductive health. That's my yeah. clinical area. But one of the things that I noticed much more in my work around this was that everything that I read if I looked on the internet, if I looked in terms of even a lot of the training that I had had, um, most of the issues that, that related to sexual health spoke about women. And that yeah. actually, if you yeah. think about the, the way healthcare systems work, across, you know, within the world and everywhere else, often our systems are set up in, a, in as such that we monitor the health and particularly the reproductive health of women, as a matter of course. So almost from, if you think about women's reproductive um, health, that covers everything from pre-puberty right through to post-menopausal. And at various stages throughout a woman's life, we, do, we, we have monitors, we have checks, we have clinical systems and we have places for help and support whether that's about pregnancy whether it's about motherhood whether it's around issues that might affect the reproductive system or the psychological the social and the emotional journey that women go through in their reproductive lives we don't however have a similar pattern for men and I was a nurse working in the late eight, certainly in the late 80s and um, into the 90s, particularly at the time of HIV and AIDS, around much more discussion around sexual well-being, not just sexual illness. Um, and what I found was that we had many men came to see me and many men came either on their own or with their partners or their partners came to report issues around their, their male partner's sexual health. But there wasn't very much information um, and there certainly wasn't um, an open um, recognition of the need for men to be sexually healthy. Um, men were usually only talked about in terms of sexual infection or sexual illness. And so this book is the result of lots of work that I did as a practitioner, lots of discussions that I had with men as, um, as colleagues, as um, other healthcare practitioners, as patients, as service users, as friends, as family. So it's based on research that I have done, as well as experience of working with and supporting men and women yeah. and couples through issues around sexual health and reproduction. 
Right, right. I think it's really important subject. And as you said, we still are in the times, even back then, 2008, when your book was released, that people pay more attention to women's health. And uh, even women themselves, they're more aware and they're more kind of caring about their own health. Whenever something happens to a woman, what do we do? We straight away, we Google things, we research things, we go to doctors, we speak to friends, we enter the WhatsApp chats, whatever else, right? Mm -hmm. And when something <laughs> yeah. happens to men, they always just brush it off and they say, well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So especially when we're um, talking about, yeah? It's, no, it's very interesting you say that, um, Olga, because as you were speaking, I was thinking about um, one of the things that, I mean, this, this the work around men's sexual health kind of, it, is something that I've been doing well over, well over 20 odd years. It's, it's wow. it, part of my work in men's sexual health um, in 19... 88 so we're we're well over 20 oh know, yes we are 20 years we're, yeah, well we're well over well over come up yeah. that time and um well when you when you think about it one of the things that strikes me um which is something that that threads its way through all my work is the lack of discussion around certain oh, issues yes. we, we touched on that when we met last time didn't we yes we did yeah that there are areas of health and there are areas of that are about inclusion and inclusive practice. The way we make sure that what we do um, gives people an equal chance of health. Yeah. And there are areas of that that are silent or silenced. Yeah. And that's exactly what I was thinking when you were talking about what do we do? Women, we talk. There are, there are mechanisms. There are procedures. There are ways in which we are socialized into talking. Yeah. And then in terms of health, there are systems in place that help us to talk. Yes. But for men, the silence is deafening. Yes. Yeah. It definitely is. It definitely is. And it how do they break that? How do they break that? I mean, I know we speak quite a lot about that. And it's like we, we welcome more and more men to talk about that. And I'm really glad to see that men are stepping up and men mm -hmm. are doing changes about that. But how do you think we actually can not push, push would be the wrong word to use. How, how can we encourage men to be more mindful about these conversations and, and to be okay about having these conversations? I think I think it's 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 a difficult one because of course. As I said, the, the reason it's, it appears easier for women is because we're socialised into it from very young, you know. But also, if, particularly when we're talking about sexual health, the structures and the, and the opportunities are in place for us to do that. So uh, very similar to talking about anything that's sensitive, sometimes people need permission to speak about these things. And permission is more than just saying it's OK for you to tell me. Sometimes it's about in opening a conversation um, and many things around men's sexual health. I think for us, particularly if we're working as, um, you know, uh, in, a, in a consultative way, if we're working as coaches, if we're working as, um, you know, kind of therapists in any way, that actually, and if we're even supporting men as members of our family, friends, our network, you know, we have to... Um, recognize that it's quite difficult to just start a conversation about something that is so personal and that often the information that people need is difficult to get to. I think the internet and actual um, having these online discussions are part of the way for people to start to get used to the fact that particularly for men that actually it's okay to have these conversations and that sexual and reproductive health is about health. It's about health socially, emotionally, spiritually and it's as well as being about physical health and you know one of the things as a sexual health professional one of the things that we recognize is that you know sexual health is more than sex itself mm. however often although sex is not a large part of everybody's life I mean it's important but it's not the large yeah. part of everybody's <laughs> life yeah. but it's often the place where problems elsewhere first emerge Ah, oh, I'm glad you so, said. So, when problems, problem when people come and as a sexual health professional and a sexual health nurse, when people come to see me with issues or around their sexual health, um, physical issues around their sexual health or around sex itself, it's often a consequence or a, a indicator 
of problems elsewhere, whether it's emotionally, uh, socially, spiritually, just, you know, anxiety, whether it's all these things. It's never simply just a physical problem that you can give a pill to or give a treatment to and it's gone. Often when the psychological, the social or the emotional issue is dealt with, then for many people, the, the physical aspects in terms of sexual health, you know, are able to be to be um, treated or are able to be overcome. I'm so glad you said it, Laura. I'm so glad you said it because many people, they underestimate how much psychological effect people have on their sexuality and what happens down there. And it's not about physical down there. It's about how do you feel in terms of intimacy. It's about what, how do you feel about what, what's right, what's wrong and, and everything else. And unfortunately, many people, they're in a position where they don't feel comfortable talking about that. They don't feel comfortable to open up and yeah. to get to need to greet to, to why things are the way they are. But what would you say in your book? What do you think is the, as a, from the author's point of view, what do you think is the most important part in your book? Why man should actually go buy it and check it out? Because I'm sure it has a lot of important information and I know it. But from your point of view, you have the most important points in that book what that would be? I think the most important point for me is recognizing that sexual and reproductive health is part of who we are as human beings. Yes. And that actually sexual and reproductive health is more than just physical performance. It's actually about how we feel socially and emotionally part of ourselves. So it takes into account not just your physical gender, but it also takes into back your emotional and social gender. Oh, yeah. And one of the things in, in men, for men particularly, is that it, certainly in, in the UK and certainly in the Western world, it's not the same across all countries. Yeah. In the Western world particularly, there's an element of sexual and reproductive health that's mm -hmm. so tied up with our views about masculinity and what it means to be male. Yeah. That there's an element of physical performance that has to take place. And often the social and the emotional sense of self is kind of second class or not seen as so important. Mm. And I think one of the things that is changing and certainly has changed, thankfully, a lot more since, since I actually um, wrote this particular book, is that we recognise much more, as we said last, around mental health, around emotional yeah. and social health and how those things help us to be who, who we need to be. So, I mean, one of the interesting things is that um, if we think about emotional and social health and well-being and our sense of self or a men's sense of self, it's tied up with family, it's tied up with mm. community, it's find that, tied up with being male or man enough. And happily, I think, that being man enough is not just around a physical sense of self. Yeah. Although we do have to recognise that things like reproduction, things like sexuality, things like sexual performance, they're all very, they're, in some ways, they're even much more tied up, much more strongly with men than sometimes they are with women. Um, and there's a sense of, men, men have spoken to me and they do talk about a sense of being a man enough in, right. in terms of what is expected of them. And often, if they don't feel that they're man enough, then um, their identity, their self-identity around sexual health and their sense of self is where you, you, you would see that first. And that's the same whether they have um, relationships with women or whether they have relations with men or whether they have relations oh. with both. So it's not something that's specific to heterosexual or straight couples. And that I was think my that's the big, the big learning here that actually it's not as simply as talking about men and women. It's actually about talking about masculinity and being male. That's really interesting because that was my next question. As you were talking, I was just dying to ask this. Right? <laughs> I was thinking, because your book says men's sexual health. And my question was, how about those who are who are gay couples, right? How about them? Because in every relationship, we have somebody who is more dominant than another. We have somebody who is more masculine than another. And, you know, how do we address that? You know, how, how do we resolve that? 
Well, I think the thing is, and I think this is why it's really important, it's really important that we we discuss and we engage with discussions around men's uh, sexual health from a position of being male, not simply from a position of being male as opposed to female, um, because the, the complexities around relationships, and, and now, again, I say happily, it was a sexual health profession, I say happily, that idea of sexuality and sexual expression is much more fluid than it, than, than a binary gender if but if we think about maleness as a as a characteristic as a social definition as a psychological position as a as an identity yeah then actually the traits that are associated with maleness respect of whether they're held by a man or a woman or anybody at all is they, those things do sometimes prevent us from showing our vulnerability, from questioning. Um, and unfortunately, that's then mirrored within people's expectations. So it, it's not about male, female, it's actually about maleness. And so in same-sex right. relationships, in same-sex relationships, the, in some, in some, to some degree, and certainly from my experience of working with gay men, um, it's the, sometimes the pressure is even more intense mm. because because often in heterosexual relationships, in straight relationships, what happens is often women act, act as a conduit, a way for men to speak. Mm. So, for example, I would have women who'd come to see me and they would talk about the issues their male partner was having or their brother or somebody yeah. else. And then that would help them to get an answer and I would encourage them to, and they would c come with them. Now imagine a scenario where, and, and this would happen because the woman was attending for a routine checkup. Right, women, right. From, from the age of puberty through to menopause, there are regular places in our system, certainly in our system in, in yeah. the West Western, where women are called to be checked. Yes. Constantly it may seem sometimes. But in calling in call to be checked, there's an opportunity for you to raise quite sensitive issues and talk with your with the health professionals. Beyond the age of puberty, in fact, beyond the age of, of school age, to be honest, there, there are not regular set up instances where men are recalled as part of a national program for checking around their sexual and reproductive health. That does not happen. Wow. So therefore, the, the opportunity, if you're in a, if you're in a same-sex relationship and two, as two males, mm. where is the opportunity for that conversation yeah. to be supported without you as a male having to almost confess the fact that yeah. you need to and make an appointment yeah. specifically to try and have that conversation? Yes. <laughs> The, the pressure to be male is the same and different at the same time, whether you're in sex relationships or whether you're in, in a straight relationship. Mm. So therefore, the pressure is the same. On, you, you, it's almost like a tinderbox of two things. Probably we're, we're relationships, what, what's sim similar, or relationship, I believe, is that where there is that supportive environment for discussion, that discussion will take place. There we go. But if the problem and the issue around sexual and reproductive health is within the relationship, without that supportive environment, that conversation may never happen. It's true. And one of the things around, yeah, one of the things around sexual and reproductive health is it's really, really a difficult subject because from for most people, from being very small, it, it, it's one of the things that even in very open families that they don't necessarily talk about. So again, yeah. we're not socialized into having these conversations. True. But you know what's really interesting here? I, I totally agree with you sharing the wisdom about how important it is for couples, whether it is gay, straight, or uh, lesbian couples, to talk about this stuff within the families. But I think we still have these kind of perception or belief that we can be often misunderstood and misheard. And I think that's one of the other issues as well where people don't open up. Because even in the same relationships where the two partners are talking about their issue, which is within 
between them only, <laughs> right? Not something happened between other partners, but within them. I think it's still quite challenging sometimes to open up and share that. And yeah. amount of couples who came to see me and we were addressing this area, the intimacy, and amount of times when I had to really almost like retranslate the importance of talking and discussing and what's, what feels right, what feels wrong and how things should be and just have open conversations. It, it really scares me, Laura. It really, really scares me how how little people still feel like they can be open talking yeah. about this subject. And I think books like yours are definitely, definitely very helpful. Do you plan to write any book on women's sexuality? So we will have <laughs> a book as well. Oh, it's interesting because I say I, this book was written a, lo a, a, a long time ago and people yeah. still use it and they still use the information. I think it's time for an update for that book. I do have uh, plans to write another book around sexual, sexual and reproductive health and but focusing more about the importance of speaking um, because um, you know, one of one of the key phrases that, that I use within within my um, social media work and within my work is around the importance of silence, speaking about silence issues. So my hashtag silence speaks relates to that. It's about allowing the stories with and our experiences within us to come out because they are the best reflection of who we are. And yeah. it's through our stories that people understand more about us. And I think that works particularly well when you've got very sensitive issues around sexual health. Yeah. Because the, the, the problem is with sexual and reproductive health, and this is for men and for women, um, but even more so for men, is we don't really have the language and the words to help us be understood and to be heard. Yeah. Because if you look at the information that we often have around sexual and reproductive health, it either is very clinical, yeah, like from you know biology lessons at school. It's around the structure yeah. of, the of the body, full of jargon, mm -hmm. full of jargon, and full of things that people aren't quite sure exactly what that means, but nobody wants to ask. Um, and or the language is very very sexualized in a way yeah. that that is many people don't find comfortable or very much linked to sexual activity and pornography and things that people don't feel comfortable in speaking about in the everyday and so between those two extremes it's quite difficult then to find the words to say what you mean um, and so one of the things about the book is it's a good way of raising issues and starting to discuss around issues because it gives you some background it gives you information and you know even to be able to have online discussions like this by having this discussion and people commenting and people asking questions and people rereading it or even using it to to trigger conversations either as a couple or even with their own children again uh, and with with other people they know it provides a platform um, where people can actually begin to discuss some of these Love issues. Because, uh, you know, it, it's if you think about our well-being mm -hmm. and if you think about our health in the truest sense as human beings, sexual and reproductive health is part, if without sexual and reproductive health, none of us would be here. Yes. In the first place. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> but also, it, it's... It's something that it's something that when it goes well gives us a feeling of well-being which is beyond kind of just the physical and it's a, a sense of self, a sense of identity, mm. a sense of belonging, a sense yeah. of place. All these things are linking to our sexual and reproductive health, a sense of acceptance. Yes. If we think about all the things that if we think about all the trigger points, the tension in here. They're linked with whether or not you're accepted. They're linked with how you feel. They're linked in knowing how someone else feels about you. They're linked in feeling accepted. They're linked in being able to reproduce. They're linked in maybe accepting you can't reproduce, but knowing yeah. that you're loved anyway. So yeah. sexual and reproductive health covers the whole spectrum of those things. But ultimately, they form a very, very strong sense for all of us of who we are and our place in the world. Yes. And, and I think, you know, we so we can't underestimate it. We can't underestimate it. And that's much, much more than what happens 
with the lights off under the sheets, if that's your preference. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And the amount of people who are still are feeling quite shy to talk about mm. that is still big. Yes. So I hope that books like yours and also shows like this and uh, just in general, information out there will help people mm -hmm. to educate themselves more. Yeah. Because the last thing what we want to do is just to be ignorant and not to talk about such important yeah. things. Because as I said earlier in the, at the very beginning of this video, it affects every aspect and mm -hmm. area of your life and how psychology affects the sexual life and sexual life starts affecting everything else, including how we perform at work. Because yeah. when you have some, I don't know, issues, things which you think about, something not right mm. in terms of your sexuality, in terms of your intimate life, unfortunately, that will be on your mind and that will affect mm. the way how you can perform at work. Yeah. I think, I mean, I, I think that's really important. I also think, Olga, that it's a really important issue to think about for employers. I think yeah. sometimes, you know, if we have, if we, if we, if we have teams that we, that we support, if we have people that work for us, sexual and reproductive health, again, is one of those things in terms of well-being that we need to consider. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly, you know, if we think about we do we, we go part of the way, but not all the way. So yeah. we, we're comfortable in talking about sexual health and sexual and reproductive health when we're talking about pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So we're comfortable in thinking about people need time off to go to appointments, they need you know time off when they've had yeah. babies and happily when too time off to have babies. What about prostate cancer? Yes. What about prostate checks? Yeah, if you think that as we as men grow older, and this is something that's talked about in the book, as men grow older, you know, on average, it's about 50-50 that you will have, that men will have a, a prostate related issue as they get older. Not all will have prostate cancer, yes. but that's a natural part of aging for about half the population of men. Which is quite scary but when yeah, you think about it. Quite scary, but for most people it's benign. It's just growth of the prostate gland. And again, some people don't even know where the prostate gland is. Yeah, you know, but the prostate gland is really important because it's it's the gland which helps to control and manage both emptying of the bladder and also emptying of of, of, of the um, semen during uh, sex. Yeah. So you can imagine it's supposed to contract and relax so that the right yeah. thing comes out at the right time, which could be a bit <laughs> embarrassing if it doesn't. Um, yes, exactly. But anyway, as it, as sometimes, with some men, as they get older, it gets bigger. And sometimes it becomes less elastic as well. So sometimes that's one reason why as men get older, they may find themselves going to getting up in the night to go to the toilet. That is a normal thing for many people and nothing to worry about mm -hmm. unless it starts interfering with your life. Yeah. But for some people, it can become developing to a, it can be due to a cancer as opposed to just a benign that is non non problematic mm -hmm. increase in size. Now, you would think for me that if we're going to say roughly half of the people will have the issue, we kind of need to know quite early who will and who won't. Yes. But yet we, you know, yet it's we don't have routine testing. You know, the man has to think I have a problem or their partner thinks you've got a problem and then they have to go to the doctor and then it's whether or not the doctor will do a test. Exactly. So these are the kinds of things where I think it allows us to think, oh, actually, it's not just me. Mm -hmm. And being able to, because the biggest challenge to men's sexual and reproductive health is particularly around prostate cancer is late presentation, take, spend, taking too mm -hmm. long to go to the doctor or to seek help. Yeah. And that's often because they spend a lot of time living with a condition. Because let's face it, if, if your partner gets up in the night and goes to the toilet, you're not going to go, what's wrong with you? you know? No, your thing you is just a one off thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah. You might, what, what people tend to say is, oh, well, I just, I always get up in the night. And I thought yeah. that was normal. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. It could be, but then it could not be. But so you see, by the time people think, oh, gosh, there's definitely a problem here. It's been a long time down the road. But yeah. if we were able to have these conversations earlier, it may be something we can say, you know, maybe should we check that out? Or maybe I just keep an eye on it. Is it yeah. just at night? Do I have to? And without getting to too much detail as an example, yeah, there, are, well, there are different ways to go to the toilet, right? There are yeah. different ways to, you know, and go to the toilet, then 
that's yeah. fine. If there's there's also having to rush, and then when yeah. you get there, happens. Or you can get there and rush, and it's almost like immediate. You you can't you don't have control. Mm. And if you have control that you have, that is an indicator that the relaxing and contracting as it should. There we go. Well, that is an indicator. That's something to go, do you know, I need to check this out. But if you yeah. don't know information, why would you? It's very easy to just think, well, this is just how I am. Exactly. And then people start thinking, or men should start thinking, should they say that, oh, it could be just me stressing about something happening at work. Mm. It could yeah. be me right now being in this lockdown situation and worrying about my business. It could yeah. be something else. When actually it, it is... Yeah, it could it could be absolutely. Yeah. But I think you're right when you said earlier as well that we women we have regular checkups during our uh, menstrual time, which we have in our lives, to go to doctors and check on ourselves, and men don't. And if that would be something that could be addressed and said, like, look, man, at least every two or three years or whatever is right. I mean, <laughs> you know better than me, right? You should go to doctor, and this is your normal checkup, and that maybe doctors they will be arranging appointments well in advance or sending yeah. a letter like we receive. I'm sure yeah. we could. I'm sure we could eliminate so many more problems resulting yeah. in better families, better businesses, better yeah. workplaces, better everything. Yeah. But I think I think you're absolutely right. And and it is something press for. But I think even starting to talk about that is 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 a big change and what we need to do. Yeah. So for example, as you said, people at the moment we're in lockdown, people have got stress with work, they've got their responsibilities and everything else that's going on. They may feel stressed. And they will they will recognize the psychological stress and think, oh, this is why I might have a headache or why I might be a bit short tempered or why I might be frustrated or why I might be feeling a little down. I can understand all that. They may not necessarily make the connection and think that's why I'm finding it hard to perform sexually or that's why I'm you know, agitated or that's why I don't feel like myself or that's why I don't I, I don't feel any desire all yeah. these things are also reactions to stress. Mm. And, you know, it isn't it isn't just simply that, you know, there may be men now at this period in time who have some of those symptoms that we've discussed and haven't actually thought that that's a reaction to the situation. They just thought, oh, I'm just a bit off today or I'm just I just don't feel like it. Yes. Yeah. So these are also so these are also similar conditions they're also stress reactions in the reproductive system that's how the reproductive system reacts to stress yeah i love how you address it because actually here we have a comment uh which uh, just to protect the um name and the personality i will not release the name yeah. if, uh, this person wants to say his name uh but he says i often need to go to the bathroom in the night usually around 3 a.m do you think it could be something emotional or do you think it's something what uh, this person actually should have addressed what would be your it, thoughts it, it could be both and this is what i'm saying is that urgency getting up in the night the hormonal they're, they're often hormonal reactions right. as well so, for example, if we if we the reason I'm mirroring it to pregnancy is because more people are familiar with pregnancy, if you see what I mean, because we talk about it all the time. So one of the reasons why women get up and go to the toilet in the middle of the night when they are pregnant, certainly known pregnancy, is because of hormonal changes. OK, so men also have hormonal changes. I know we all joke about the male menopause, but men also have hormonal changes at different points in their life. But equally with men, when they are very stressed and they have an increase in something in, in, their, in your system called cortisol, which is like a mimics a, a hormone reaction. When they have that, that also can call, get up in the night and go to the toilet. It causes the bladder not to be so st stable. So that can be a reaction. Equally, as the prostate gland gets larger, age sometimes or infection or a whole race, range of reasons that also causes the bladder to be um, needing to be emptied in the night right. so it could be any of those things one of the things to to think of check is if you if you reduce the amount you drink before you go to bed so you're not having lots to drink before you go to bed and yet you're still getting up in the middle of the night mm. then it's less about what you do before you go to bed because often people go oh it's because i have a drink of a drink before I go to bed because physically if there's nothing in the bladder why would you be getting or very little in the bladder why yeah. would you be getting it? 
But remember, the bladder very rarely completely empties. It always has a little bit of urine in it. So if you're getting up with just that little bit, it's not because your bladder is full. Mm. The other thing you're meant to be mindful of, I've mentioned before, and I'll just repeat, is if you are getting up in the middle of the night and you, it's not usual for you, because for yeah. some people that's their usual pattern, yeah. there's no change. What you're looking for is a change in pattern, not just because I'm up in the night, there must be a problem. A change right. in pattern. And also take take heed of what happens when you actually get to, to when you get to the loop. Do you are you able to pass your in normally? OK. Or do you get there and then you kind of have to hesitate? You have to wait a bit before your urine will start to flow. Do you feel like you're bursting to go and when you get there? Nothing happens. All these are different indicators that you need to look at. Do you, are you able to empty your bladder? But actually, when you do it, it doesn't it feels it doesn't feel like a very strong stream. It's kind of dribbly or it stops and starts. And one yeah. thing to try to see, are you able to stop once you've started? Can you actually make yourself stop? It's like the pelvic floor exercise. Yes. Yeah. They're as important for men as they are for women. We only talk about them for women. I know. Them. Exactly. Yeah. As important for men as they are for women. So men, too, have to do pelvic floor exercises. So. These are the things you can try if you are getting up just to see, is it stress? Is it, you know, are you awake and then wanting to go to the blue or is wanting to go to the blue waking you up? They're slightly yeah. different things. Yeah. So these are the kind of things you can think about. Wonderful advice. Really wonderful advice. And actually, we have uh, here a thanks and says, I will, this is important advice. So thank you so much, Laura. <laughs> yes, sir. Very I welcome. Very welcome. <laughs> Yes, but thank you so much for this comment. Really appreciate that. And yes, we, we should take care of this area and we should think about that because, again, as we discussed earlier, it affects absolutely every aspect and area mm -hmm. of our lives. And when people are worried about something that happens with their general health, that already is quite stressful. It, that yeah. impacts their productivity. It impacts how, uh, how much they can pay attention to details at work and for how long they can focus on something. But when there's yeah. something as sensitive as a sexual problem, this one actually we take it to a completely different level emotionally. And we worry about that a lot more and we'll mm -hmm. overthink about it a lot more. And what I'm fascinated about, how much people search on Google before yeah. they go and see specialists, right? Yeah. This, I think, is the most fascinating thing. I mean, Google <laughs> does Google not doctor. help. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I mean, Google does not help. You need to go to really see specialists because the last thing what you want is just to be affected by you having some issues down there, not being able to speak to your yeah. partner and allow all your life to be affected massively to the extent of you actually getting anxious <laughs> because of this little tiny One thing. I will say to people, and again, people may not be aware of this, um, I know there's a big stigma, there's still a stigma, there has been for years, around people going yeah. to the sexual health clinic. Yeah. Um, people think that you only need to or should go to those clinics when you think you have an infection. The sexual health clinic is about all areas of sexual health. So if you have a concern about this, then you can go there. What happens is you don't need, you, you can, you, they do have appointments, but they also have walk-in sessions. So if you feel like, I don't want to make an appointment because I might be a little embarrassed, you can look up your sex, local sexual health clinic on Google, look at the opening times, Google. and they do have walking as well. But you can just go and walk in. Um, and actually, you go in there. And, and one of the things about that, the hardest thing about those clinics, when I worked in them, is actually walking in. But when you get mm. inside, what you have to remind yourself is every single person in that place is there because they have an issue around sexual or reproductive health. Right. So the fact that you're already there, the nurses, the doctors, the people you will, the advisors that you will see are there to talk about sexual and reproductive health. So you don't have to pretend you've got an ingrowing toenail <laughs> or a bad bun or anything else. Because people do do that. They say, I, you know, I'm coming to the doctor because I've got a bad foot. And then they get <laughs> do in they the really? Room. Well, like, yes, well, actually, it's not my foot. It really is something else. But in that way, everybody is there for the same reason. Yes. Yeah. So you don't need to be embarrassed by anybody else because ev all everybody's in the same boat. Mm. And I think they are places where there are specialists around sexual and reproductive health. They'll be able to allay your fears if it's something that you're yeah. just concerned about. They'll be able to give you very accurate, up-to-date advice. They'll also be able to do any tests 
in the place. They will not be sending you away. They will do whatever needs doing there and then, and they will give you the results as fast as possible. So therefore, you can get reassurance very quickly. It's You don't need a referral from your GP. You can just walk in yourself. Love that. And people just need to know more about that. This is mm. probably where Google can help. <laughs> yeah. Google that. Yeah. Yes, this will actually Google can help you. Just go find out. And even if there's no problem at all, I think if there's no problem at all, no issues, whenever you have a free time, it's just good to go walk in, check yourself out, and just to have a nice day after that, knowing that actually everything is absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah, it is really important. Yes. And sometimes it's just about, certainly in my experience, sometimes what people, a lot of people need, and particularly in men, it's reassurance. Yes. It's reassurance. Actually, this is, this is the range of normal. And the normal has a huge range in both women and men's sexual health. You know, one of the problems is that we, we see things on the TV, we see what masculine is supposed to look like, we might read things online, we might look at things in books. And the perfection of the human body is in its diversity. It's in its difference. It's in its range. And certainly, you know, I would speak for myself and I speak for my fellow colleagues as a, as a sexual and reproductive health uh, uh, practitioner and specialist. There's very little I haven't seen. And it's yeah. mostly <laughs> <all> normal. <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. Normal, huge. Um, and, and I think sometimes it's just that reassurance. Yeah. Of, of normality and you know there isn't just one 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 kind of view there's yeah. there's many many things and many many things that impact on us but the worry about it is often worse than the reality oh yeah because it leads to stress when you worry about something what you don't have certainty about and clarity yeah. you, you start stressed about you start paying attention to the way you drive you start paying attention to what your partner yeah. says you start stop paying attention to what your boss or manager says or what results your business made and then eventually long story short you see everything crashing in your life just because yeah. you're overstressed and there could be nothing even serious but you know laura i'm just curious right now I mean, I, I really would love to ask you a question. What would be the most hilarious story you probably came across? <laughs> but, oh, you'd be surprised. I'm really? You'd be surprised, yes. Can, can you share but, any you which will be under I, I, I qualified uh, as a nurse in 1986, so it's a good 30 odd years. Wow. So that's a lot of stories. <laughs> oh, yes, I can imagine. I absolutely can imagine. But do you have any funny story which would be appropriate to share, bearing in mind we're on a live video? <laughs> No, what well, we can say in polite, some polite company. I think um, probably one of not not the funniest, but probably one of the most surprising. Um, right. Stories I had it, it is actually around um, a gentleman who um, was very worried about the fact that that um, he and his partner had been trying to get pregnant for a long time, and he was very worried that it wasn't happening, and that actually it, it was him that was he felt that he was at fault. And quite a lot of our discussion I had with him was about this idea of fault. And um, he was saying, well, you know, it's 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 my, you know, my understanding is that it's down to the man to make the woman pregnant. All he'd heard when he was younger was men make women pregnant. And that's what <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and um, it was quite funny because he he also felt that um, he wasn't he felt that he wasn't well endowed shall we say and that was the problem mm. and um, nothing could be done and actually in talking to him it were, it, what, what transpired was he got himself in such a state oh. of fear um, and, that he actually used to use any excuse um, to actually not um, kind of be undressed or be seen <gasps> um, naked which and wow. the reason I think this is not that it's strange is because often you hear about that with women but you don't often hear yes. about that with men and some of the tales he told me about the ways in which he 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 used to think about how does he get um in the, the bedroom in his bedroom the light switch was next to the door which it is for many people but it was quite a large bedroom and he said there was eight about eight steps he had to take from the from the light switch to the bed and so he had to work out how to get from the bed to the light switch. it was all right going to bed because wow. he could switch the light off, and he'd yeah. work out how to get him in not to be seen naked but obviously when he came to going out of the bed it was a long way to the to thing so he told me how he had next to the, on his side of the bed a series of um 
not so much a dressing up box, but a series of, of drapes he could use around himself and different different kind of styles so that he could put slip one of these on and leave the bedroom. And he was he was saying that um, in the end it became a bit more a bit, a bit more like a jokey thing for him and his partner. So yeah. he'd got like Superman pants, <laughs> and one with cartoons on, and you know that. everything else. And all this had been going on for years just so that he could walk from the bed to the to the door. And it wow. just made, made me smile because I thought to myself, well, you've turned it into a funny thing, but underneath that there is an anxiety. But yes, you know surely it's taking much more work just to find comedy underpants than it is to actually talk Absolutely. to Absolutely. It was, uh, but most of our conversation was about the comedy underpants rather than the actual, you know, issue that he, that he went to. Eventually we got through to it, but it took me a good four weeks talking about comedy underpants before he actually starts to talk about what the real issue was. But I found that was quite surprising. I've never spoken about comedy underpants so many times in a, in the space of a few weeks as a professional, but. Wow. I think this is a great example how very often we can take one little thing to a completely next level. Yeah. And good for him, he took it with a bit of a humor and it was a comedy, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. actually people can take it really seriously. Yeah. And